let's talk a little bit about uh, what are the negative effects of party controlled primaries. Uh, so we've touched on it a little bit and I've seen it. Um, so uh, number one is you're gonna have an incumbent from one of the two parties. Um, and so if you have a safe seat, then, and I've, I've been supporting candidates down ballot, so I've seen some of this. Um, so you can have the person get primaried from within their party. Um, and, and then if they get to the general, then it's a foregone conclusion. Like, you know, you don't even need to pay attention to the general really in a lot of these districts in like 80% of the districts. So you wind up with only one real challenge to the incumbent. And that is within their party primary because you have a party controlled primary system. Um, so by the general election, it's, it's already determined who's going to win. Um, there's a quote by William Tweed, uh, that said, um, uh, that, that, yeah, that, that, that said, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. <laughs> and so, um, so, uh, so the, so the problem with the party controlled primary system is that, uh, it restricts voter choice. Uh, is, is that a fair way to characterize it? Again, I I absolutely want more voter choice, but let's fast forward. I want more freedom for legislators to do what needs doing. Yeah, you want a good result, yeah. Again, the real problem is not what they're saying in the primary or who even makes it through the primary. It's what they do once they're there. We, if we, had, if we got rid of party-controlled primaries, some of the talented, passionate elected officials will still win but they will now have the freedom to do what needs doing. Okay, so, so that's one of the problems with the party primaries, but here's the, another thing that I think you might, you in particular might find really interesting. I don't know if you'll call this part in my book because it's short, I'm working a longer, uh, longer article. It's called The Dual Currencies of Politics. Oh yeah, I found this fascinating. When you talk about votes and money, um, and that money is actually a better currency because if you get extra, you get to keep it. Uh, and more of it's always better. Um, whereas voting, if you get extra votes, then you don't get to roll them over to the next election. There's a lot of nuance to this. So uh, again, remember, we're looking at now politics as an industry. And so we're trying to find out what's going on in this industry. And here's a lot of times I'm talking about how it's similar to the for-profit industry. But now I want to talk about how it's different. Politics is the only industry I've come across that really has two currencies. So think of it this way, some customers in politics pay with votes, voters. Some customers, a much smaller number, pay with money, donors and special interests who are also donors. And in large part, so we think a lot of times we have a money in politics problem. And I wanna say here, we don't. What we have is a, relative value problem, like we have an exchange rate problem, like, you know, the dollar being worth way more than, you know, whatever the, the euro is worth or something. Point being, in politics right now, the currency of money is worth unbelievably much more than the currency of votes. And I'll give you a couple examples. So as you said, first of all, there's a limited utility because you only need one vote more than the other person to win the other, and you can't carry them over, whereas money has no upside limit on its utility. But a couple other things. The only time votes really have any value is in the party primary, but only in half of the primaries, right? Because if, if the district is gerrymandered or even naturally occurring a red district, the only votes that have any value are the voters that turn out to vote in the red Republican primary. So it's actually, if, if voter turnout in a primary is 20%, but you know 10% of the people are turning out here, their votes have power and have value. And then when you get to the general election, each vote is sort of worth zero because it's already decided. Determined, yeah. And you don't, you also don't care if you, turn off lots of people with the currency of votes. Because again, even if, even if you made everybody so angry that only 10 people came out for the election and there were 10 votes, as long as you got six and the other person got four, it's no problem for you. Whereas you wanna keep turning out more and more people sort of to be involved in money, but you're fine if you depress all the people who are so disgusted with 
with you know uh, politics that they stay home. So one of the chain. So whenever we're looking at the innovations I'm talking about, I'm looking at the behavior it's going to incent, but I'm also always looking back at how does it change the relative value of votes to money. And I'm going to tell you a secret about this money and politics problem. You know why there's so much money? It's just because it's a really good investment. The ROI is really good. So yeah, the ROI we, on lobbying, I saw, I saw in a study, it was, it was something like 17 to 1. I mean, like, where, where oh, the yeah, heck that's... can you get... Where the heck can you get a seventeen hundred percent return on just about anything you do in business? I mean, that, that's like, <laughs> you know, like if you're a rational business person, you're investing. There you go, rational, rational behavior. So here's the thing: what if we were able to artificially decrease by a factor of ten the amount of money in politics? You know, so all the lobbyists are spending, uh, you know, one ten uh, percent of what they used to spend but we leave all the existing rules and incentives for how people get elected and the elections machinery and legislative machinery intact. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna essentially make it 10 times cheaper for the self-interested money to get the same result. So here's the key, make votes more powerful than money. Make that currency the one that matters and then it won't make all money go out. But the point is, if the votes are more powerful, you can't buy with money what votes don't want. Yes, that's the dream. Therefore, therefore, then the money that goes in you know, will, will lessen if it's not at all connected with what's good for the country because you won't be able to get the ROI on it. You won't get the return yeah. on it. People making decisions make Why play? Decisions I can't get money. what I want. <laughs> exactly. And, so, and, and, that's, and that's fair and, and rational. And so I am always telling people, stop going after the money in politics and, go, and making it less powerful and go after making voters more powerful and go after making general election voters more powerful having an open primary where everybody's on the same ballot and then we'd have five people advance to the general election and then you rank choice voting in the general which you know we can come back to the package that means that the election is never decided in the primary it's always decided in the general and all of a sudden every voter matters because you're using rank choice voting even if the district is deeply red or deeply blue that's so much less of a problem with this system. We sort of leapfrog yeah. over the need for gerrymandering reform. Certainly not fair, gerrymandering and everything, but it's not the gating factor. Let's do final five voting, open top five primaries, plus ranked choice voting in the general elections. And in the general elections alone, and you're going to, you're going to rank these five candidates, and then we'll elect someone with the majority of, you know, the broadest appeal to the most number of voters. But the main reason, and that's what a lot of people that like RCV talk about is how it's more fair and democratic. And it is those things, and I'm for those things. But for the purpose of caring about results that make a difference in real people's lives, the main and like the, the biggest, hugest benefit of ranked choice voting is that it's, it eliminates the barrier, the biggest barrier in the politics industry to the new competition, which is the spoiler argument. Oh, yeah. Don't vote for that person. You know, you're going to waste your vote, etc. Like you get rid of it. So ranked choice voting gets rid of the spoiler effect. It gets it, it diminishes the incentives to campaign negatively because if you trash someone, then you both look bad. And then <laughs> the person in third place ends up uh, uh, coming up. Um, it makes it so that the ultimate winner has at least some kind of level of support among uh, more than 50% of the folks, which right now, if you end up with, you know, split votes, like you could have some person that no one really, well, not no one, but <laughs> less than 50% of people like um, ends up winning. Plurality winner like happened with the governor in Maine or to some extent with Donald Trump during the primary process because there were, there were places he won uh, with less than 50% um, during the nominating process. Uh, so this in, both, this in both political parties, a lot of times the the presidential primary, you know, favors these plurality winners, and you don't get sort of the person who's everybody's second choice but nobody's first choice. 
Yeah, so this was an appealing vision to me, the top five uh, plus ranked choice voting, in part because I was trying to imagine if you were an independent minded person who was considering running for office and you got some people behind you uh, and let's say there's an incumbent. Uh, let's call, you know, it could be either Democrat or Republican. It doesn't matter for this example. But you think to yourself, OK, if I get enough people behind me, all I have to do to make it to the general is be in the top five. Uh, and that seems kind of achievable. Like I just need to go out and get enough votes to be in the top five. And then if he goes, if I do get in the top five, then we all contend in a ranked choice voting format. And then if I get a lot of people behind me, not even as their first choice necessarily, but like I become everyone's second choice because, um, you know, I, I'm uh, common sense and suggesting things that people like. And, you know, like uh, it, it seems like I, I'm going to try to deliver a- along with what most of us want. Uh, so that that's like a very appealing vision. Uh, and so I, I'm I've always been a fan of ranked choice voting. And I think you and Michael helped open my mind to the fact that the primary system is a huge component of who can successfully run for office and then what their incentives are after they get there, to your point. And now we know that the primary system is a huge reason why votes have so much less power than money. Yeah, that too. Uh, because like you said, it, it's very constrained because if you're not registered in that party and one of like the, the folks who shows up to that primary, then you're just showing up to the ballot being like, well, I don't even really have. And, and this is one thing you really do have to reflect on for a moment is that for the average person in that district, they don't really have a meaningful choice uh, because if they weren't able to participate in the, the nominating party's primary, then they're just showing up to the ballot box and being like, okay, I can vote for one of these two people, but one of them is almost guaranteed to win. Uh, and it's one reason why people uh, write off politics because they're like, my vote doesn't matter. Like, uh, in, like, in, like uh, this is a waste of my time. Uh, you know, when people have that perspective, um, I look at them and I think like, this person may be rational. You know, it's like, there's some people being like, no, you're a jerk for thinking that. It's like, well maybe they're on to something. You know, it's like if you had a system where it was truly irrational, uh, then you could hold people to a higher standard because you'd be like, your vote really does matter because you can actually make a difference, uh, you know, and- um, Right now I tell people, hey, look, if you only have time to vote once, just vote on primary day. Like if you somehow can't do twice, just vote on primary day. And, and, And I also, you know, people are often saying, we need to have universal voting. We need to have mandatory voting. We need to- increase turnout. And I say, why are we artificially trying to increase turnout? You know the best way to increase turnout? Make turning out matter. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode.